Aloha and welcome and thank you for being here today. My name is Denise Conan. I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and I have the great privilege of welcoming you to this talk tonight by Tim Wu on this very special date, February 20, 20, 20. <laughs> and I'm so glad you decided to spend this special day with us here. Um, the, um, this is part of the um, Better Tomorrow speaker series um, organized by um, uh, Robert Perkinson and, and others. And we're so uh, honored to have so many from our community and our university gathered here tonight. Um, the topic of Tim's conversation is really vital to us all. Uh, the rise and consolidation of technology companies, um, how information is made available to us almost instantly, uh, motivations sometimes um, unclear uh, in ways we could even scarcely think about a generation ago. Um, and so that's made our lives just faster, more convenient, but also um, more distracted. And for those of us that have children, we can see how their, their, their lives are so much different than our own. Um, and so the tech sector and its giants um, are reshaping our society in many ways, our economy, um, the way our brains work, the way democracy works, politics, um, changes the way we're spending our time, how we relate to each other, um, even the way we feel. And um, so, so this actually um, touches many elements of the departments in the College of Social Sciences and beyond. Um, psychology, sociology, political science, economics, uh, countless other areas. Um, oh, and kidding. also the law school and, um, you know, Avi Soifer, he's teaching a class tonight. I was going to come to that. And he, um, he couldn't be with me here, but is um, really co-host and sponsor of this uh, event here uh, this evening. Um, and uh, so this, um, what Tim is talking about, really brings together such a multidisciplinary effort. Um, so many have come together to make these events possible. We have um, collaborated with not just departments and uh, schools and colleges across Manoa, but also um, important sponsors like the Hawaii Community Foundation, also Kamehameha Schools. Uh, and we're really grateful to them for making events like this so possible. So really mahalo to our sponsors. Um, in addition to the college, we had special support from the School of Communications and the Scholar Strategy Network, and I also want to make a special thanks to them. And I want to also thank uh, Kahala Resorts for partnering with our whole series. And I can say that I'm sure, Tim, that you're also very grateful to Kahala Resorts because rather than scrolling through your Instagram, you're able to enjoy an ocean view and uh, in the in the great. Kahala uh, Resorts uh, Hotel. So um, at least I hope that's a nice use distraction for you alternative. So um, with that, I'd like to, um, again, thank you all for coming out. Mahalo. Uh, and I want to welcome, um, to introduce our guest speaker tonight, law, um, our law professor, uh, Tim Wu. He will be introduced by uh, Hawaii Supreme Court Justice Saprina McKenna, who is also a proud uh, alumni of our very own Williamson, William Richardson School of Law. So thank you very much, Sabrina. We welcome you to the stage. Mahalo. Aloha, everyone. It's truly my honor and pleasure as an alumnus of the University of Hawaii undergrad and law school, as well as a former faculty member of the William S. Richardson School of Law to be able to introduce Tim Siu Ming Wu. I'm sorry, my Chinese pronunciation is not as good as my Japanese pronunciation, but his middle names, Chinese names mean in search of wisdom. And I think he's found it. 
Tim Wu is the Julius Silver Professor of Law, Science, and Technology at Columbia University Law School, where he has been teaching since 2006, and where his courses have included antitrust, copyright, criminal law, media industries, and telecommunications law. Tim is very well known in legal circles, legal circles for developing the net neutrality theory, the principle that all internet traffic should be treated equally. Tim was born in Washington, D.C. and grew up in Switzerland and Toronto. His father was Taiwanese. His mother uh, is British Canadian. They both studied as immunologists at the University of Toronto. And he and his brother attended experimental schools that emphasized creativity. His fascination with computers and technology started after his father died when he was a child in 1980, when his mother bought he and his brother an Apple II computer. Tim graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry with first class honors from McGill University in Montreal. And his, he has his JD magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. After law school, he briefly clerked uh, he worked at the DOJ before clerking with Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, and those of us in legal academia know him as the founder of the law and economics movement. He then clerked for Justice Stephen Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. After that, he worked in the Bay Area for a few years before joining legal academia at the University of Virginia, where he taught a few years before joining Columbia. Tim has advised the White House National Economic Council, the New York Attorney General's Office, as well as the Federal Trade Commission, and he has been invited by Congress to testify on various occasions. He has authored numerous articles as well as four books. I don't know where he finds the time to do this, but he's just one of those people. His first book, Who Controls the Internet, was published in 2006. The second book, The Master Switch, The Rise and Fall of Information Empires, was published in 2010. And the focus of his talk today, The Attention Merchants, was published in 2016. And for those of you who may be interested, his latest book, The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust in the New Gilded Age, was published recently. And in this book, he posits that we are in danger of repeating the curse of big bigness of the 20th century, where the failure to control excessive corporate power prompted the rise of populism, nationalism, extremist politicians, and fascist regimes. Tim points out that like in the 20th century, global industries are increasingly, increasingly controlled by a few giant firms such as big banks, big pharma, and big tech. Tim has been named twice to the political 50 list of those transforming American politics. And he was also recognized in 2013 by the National Law Journal as one of America's 100 most influential lawyers. Tim has also been honored with membership and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Tim lives in New York. He's married to another Columbia law professor, Kate Judge, who is herself an expert on financial markets, financial regulation, and regulatory architecture. And Tim, have, Tim and Kate have two daughters, ages three and six. We wish they were here with us, but they <laughs> will be here with us next time when he comes back. <laughs> Tim, we're so honored to have you here in Hawaii. Thank you so much for coming. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, and all of you present here, I present to you Professor Tim Wu. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, everybody. Well, uh, th thanks everybody for coming. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to ro thank Robert and, and everybody who organized this event. It's been, been terrific. The, uh, uh, it is true, the ocean view is fantastic. It's uh, a little bit different than New York, especially this time of year. 
On the way over, actually, somebody asked me, they said, uh, uh, you know, are you, are you familiar with, with Hawaii? You know, you know much about it. And I said, really more through mythology than, than actual experience. But I have to say the experience is, is pretty much lived up to the, the mythology. It's, uh, it's been a terrific time, even though it's been here for 24 hours. So thank you and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I've already worn three of these lays and I, it's kind of like, I, I wondered if I would get one. In fact, I've had three so far. So I, I, I count that as a successful trip. So. Uh, Enough with being upbeat. Uh, I have a very depressing thing to talk to you about <laughs> for the next, uh, next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, we'll have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to talk about this uh, topic of uh, attention hacking, um, the, the idea that, uh, that uh, attention, this, 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 this aspect of consciousness, um, has become the most contested commodity of the 21st century and um, leads you on a sort of a history of what I think are some of the most uh, important moments, these sort of turning points uh, that have led us to the world we live in today. Uh, when I wrote this book, uh, when I started writing this book in a, about 2014, um, I did not contemplate or realize that the 2020 election would be fought, you know, among others, between two uh, billionaires with, who are, are, are media figures with deep skills and experience in, in the arts of uh, attention hacking and the darker arts of disinformation, particularly uh, one of them. Uh, and I think it, it shows uh, this is a nonpartisan talk. <laughs> uh, I think it shows uh, something that just how urgent the, these, these ideas have become, that the, the, the contest for attention has almost become, I don't want to say it's everything, but it has certainly uh, become one of the contests of our time. Sometimes I think, uh, you know, to use this old trope, if, if someone from 100 years ago or, or 200 years ago uh, were to to uh, arrive in, in the United States, and what would they be surprised by? Um, probably be surprised, frankly, by the way we dress, but they would also, I think, be very surprised by the fact that every waking moment of our lives, someone or something is trying to get a little piece of your attention. And you know, whether it's a little advertisement, whether it's your email, whether it's a Facebook update, uh, or could be your children. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know which it is, but this constant effort to, uh, we, we live in a state of bombardment, which I think is really unusual. Um, you know, we read not, not 10 or 20, but thousands of efforts to try and just have you learn about this a little bit, figure out this, read this funny little joke. Oh, you're, you know, your friend. And I, I think it has started to profoundly change how we live. Um, I wrote this book in part because I, I started noticing effects in myself. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a guinea pig for my own books. And um, uh, I started noticing this phenomenon where I would, tell me if you've ever had this experience, go, go to the, my computer, and I had this idea. I was just going to write one email. <laughs> one email. I need to like tell. Uh, I, need, I need to tell so and so that I'm going to come give this talk or whatever. And then all of a sudden, I wake up and like two or th hours have gone by, and I had no idea what had happened. I've also noticed that uh, maybe maybe you're better than me. I I look at some of the. This might be a sign of age too, but I. I I look at some of the books that I read when I was younger. I have sort of trouble getting through them without starting wondering if I should check my email or, or you know what I mean, or, or phone. Even I, I even notice in movie theaters people picking up their phone to kind of see what's going. You know, watching a movie. Movies are very powerful. I've seen people like pick up the phone and like they got to adjust something and put it down. So I think we are becoming altered. I think that this contest for attention. I already mentioned politics and elections. Where, where new tools and new arts are, are being developed, transforming commerce. Uh, there's a sense that uh, 
it's always been a little true, but it's particularly true now that, you know, if you aren't noticed, you might as well not exist in, in commerce. Uh, it's affecting things like organized religion, where, um, you know, it's uh, religion, I'll talk about this later in the talk, but, um, you know, uh, organized religion, uh, churches, uh, temples, they, they have long been interested in, in, in human attention and how, how you uh, spent, where, where your consciousness is directed, but, you know, they're in a, in a fierce battle with commerce and, and usually losing. Um, some people might like that, but I'm just saying that commerce and, has, has collided and taken over from religion. So almost every aspect of life you think about, um, I think attention is somewhere involved. Now, what, maybe I should say what I mean by attention before I go on this history. Uh, it's sort of strange because attention is everywhere, but, it, but it's nowhere. Uh, it, it is, you know, what is the mind directed to? And here's a way I think that's really useful to think about uh, the, the topic of, of attention. Um, William uh, James, who uh, is a philosopher I admire, he, he uh, pointed out that at the end of your life, it's all done, you know, you're drawing in your last breaths, uh, your life will have been only that which you paid attention to or directed your attention to. That's it. That's the whole of your life experience. And when you think of it that way, you realize that how you choose to spend your attention is basically your life. You know, we have other things like, oh, I went to school, or I, you know, I learned how to surf, or whatever it was. But, but basically, how you spend that attention, that is your life. And that, that's the first thought I want you to think about. The, the second is to think that you have 168 hours every week, and Actually, we all have the exact same number, that, that it doesn't matter um, who you are, what you do. Um, thank you for spending at least one of them here. <laughs> uh, but that in, in some, you know, we think a lot about how we spend uh, our money and spend, uh, you know, our resources. I think it's time to think very hard about how we spend that critical resource called attention which is linked to time. And to realize that you know, no matter what goals you have in life, you know, maybe you want to learn to play the piano. Maybe you want to you know, spend more time with your children or loved ones or, or, or relatives. And may, maybe you want to learn how to cook. That all of those are drawing on that, that attentional store. So it is kind of the key resource for, for, for who we are and who you're going to become. It's very linked to, to self-development. Well, anyway, hopefully I've got you uh, interested in, in this topic of, of, of attention a little bit and starting to think of it as a, as a commodity, as something very valuable, as a resource. The story I'm going to tell, uh, the full story is in the book, but the, the highlights I'm going to tell are, are really a story of how attention's value became understood. Um, one of the things I did writing this book is I model it a little bit after Upton Sinclair's oil. Oil was once um, thought valueless. I think it was uh, used for uh, medicinal purposes mainly. Oil, crude oil out of the ground. And someone discovered it was valuable. And what I'm going to suggest over the next you know, 30 minutes or so is someone or a group of people started to understand that attention was valuable about 150 years ago. And that has transformed how we live. So let me tell this in, in four parts. The first, uh, the first moment I want to talk about is the invention of the intentionally driven media. So, and I want to tell the story of a fellow named Benjamin Sun, um, who was a printer in New York City. And in 18... Uh, I think 1832, had this idea. He was a kind of a newspaper man, but he had an idea for a newspaper that could make him a lot of money. Now, I have to explain the state of news at the time, 1830, in New York City. Uh, newspapers were considered something for uh, wealthy people. Uh, they were expensive. And they were excruciatingly boring. 
Uh, if you go back, and you know, being a researcher, I went and read some of them. Uh, they generally uh, contain sort of news of ships coming and going, uh, diplomats arriving, and they reprinted in full political speeches. Uh, so, you know, they weren't really so hot. They made their money by being sold uh, for money. So Benjamin, Sun had, he had a, he, Benjamin uh, Day had a different idea. He got a new paper called the New York Sun. And it had uh, several features. So the first thing is he decided it would be more interesting, more exciting, uh, have um, news that would, people would relate to. I have here, in fact, a, a copy of the, uh, Here's the, the first, uh, I believe this is the first day. That's how they looked. Um, um, like I said, if you, uh, we're getting dumber. We can't read that kind of thing anymore. But yeah, it was, so he hadn't, he hadn't mastered everything. They hadn't figured out art or photographs or anything like that. But they, he did have exciting stories. It doesn't look too exciting. Uh, somewhere in the middle, there's a story of, uh, of a young man who committed suicide uh, because he wanted to be with his lover, but his father wanted to send him to Indonesia. Uh, there's another story in there of um, an Irish couple uh, who were fighting, and um, uh, the court ordered them, I can't, uh, they were fighting and throwing bottles at each other, something like that. So, so it was full of like, news that was uh, more interesting. The second thing, that, that his second big innovation, uh, and this was the, 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 the truly profound thing, is he decided to sell it for one penny. The, the, the cost of a common article, a bar of soap or something like that, uh, or even something even cheaper than that. So that was a money-losing proposition, financial suicide, unless he could do something else, and that is attract enough of an audience so that he could resell the audience to advertisers. So this was the first newspaper that had the idea, maybe you've heard this before, that its readers would not be the customers but would be the product. So the people who were reading this newspaper for, for, for a penny and you know, think enjoying themselves were actually what he was cultivating to sell to other people. And he did this because he thought he would make more money. And at first it didn't quite work. There was problems, he was losing money. But I guess maybe he doubled down on the, uh, the st stories from, from court or something. But he eventually started to make money. And then it grew and, it got, and, and started to become a, a great success. And in that moment, and I realize I focus on that, this ad-supported business model, which uh, also powers these tech platforms that we have come to love and hate, um, for the first time took off like the Wright Brothers airplane working. You know, I think it's actually of a similar importance because for the first time you had something taking our attention, getting us interested in stuff, reselling it somewhere else. Now let me tell you a little bit more how about his story went. So he had this business model, started making money. Um, and uh, I think we can learn something from what happened next because uh, he began to attract competitors who realized this was a way of making money. There was one early newspaper that was uh, kind of like a version of ESPN, it was all sports news. But his most fierce competitor, his fiercest competitor was a man named Gordon Bennett. He's a Scotsman with, if you look at his pictures, his crossed eye, kind of strange guy, um, who founded a newspaper whose major topic was death. <laughs> all he did was write about murders, uh, either present day murders or historical murders. There was, I think one, one researcher went through one, 14 deaths in this, and other news too, but basically murders. Murder, murder, murder. And he actually pioneered some journalistic techniques. Uh, he uh, was one of the first to report live on, on murders. So he would go and he would describe the scene. And you know, this is 1830, I think like, you know, there wasn't other forms of entertainment, there wasn't TikTok or something, so reading about, um, you know, a graphic description of a prostitute who had been murdered with a hatchet and burned uh, to death. And the descriptions, he's kind of a weird guy. His descriptions are kind of racy, um, for want of a better word. Uh, they're not 
obscene, but they're kind of racy anyway. So that, that's what he did. And he also uh, had the idea that he would uh, pick fights with other editors. So he, uh, I think, described uh, Benjamin Day as, uh, uh, as fat or something. Benjamin Day called him short. Or maybe that was these days. I can't remember. But anyway, he, got, he, they, he would insult other people. They got in these huge sort of beef wars between the editors. Uh, you can see how many elements of our society were created in this exact moment. So anyway, so he started, uh, this, this, this fellow, uh, the competitor, Gordon Bennett, I should probably have a picture of him. And he looks so weird. Uh, he, um, uh, he started gaining. Death was more popular than, than, uh, lurid, uh, lurid, uh, than just lurid tales. So the, the son had to come up with something, Benjamin's son. And we had to go do something. So he commissioned an exclusive. He um, managed to contact an eminent scientist astronomer who had built the world's largest telescope in South Africa. And he commissioned or managed to obtain an exclusive, a six-part series of the first reports of what the telescope could see on the moon. And um, you know, so some, this is break, cutting edge science. That was, you know, one, always wonder what's up there. And, you know, it was, kind of, it was, it was startling what he found. Um, um, in fact, I think we have, have a picture of uh, what they found on the moon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was, uh, um, you know, in some ways, like the Earth, it, it had uh, lakes and waterfalls. But uh, they, uh, and th but this reported as news, not, not, uh, not as uh, anything else. So, in some ways, uh, like Earth, they had lakes and stuff. But the main uh, excitement was over the creatures. There was these strange birds with, with strange heads. And, uh, uh, and they waited till the, I think, fifth article to reveal the discovery of the man bat, who uh, <laughs> there's a closer view, who was really not that different than, than us, could be seen flying, um, but had a tremendous sexual appetite. I don't know why they put that in there, but they told you. And um, you can see there's some cliffs that they're sitting on. So th this was a sensation. Uh, the, the newspaper started selling out. And it roared uh, to success. And through this uh, series, um, the Sun managed to uh, become the widest circulation newspaper in the entire world. And so it was a great success. So I think you have a sort of few lessons in how the attention economy works from this small episode, even just the beginnings of it. Um, you can see that beef wars uh, work, very popular. The war for attention tends to gravitate towards the more lurid, the lower. And above all, we see here, I don't know if it's the only invention, but this is possibly the invention of fake news <laughs> <laughs> in this particular thing. And I want to say one final thing about this uh, article. There were, in subsequent decades, some questioning as to the scientific veracity of this particular <laughs> series. Um, I worked, looked hard, never retracted. So that is the beginnings of the, of the, of the press. And I want to stress sort of the, the, the logic of what I've, I've said. In this moment, you see the discovery, the possibility of a business built on human attention alone. And I think that is something with profound consequences as we look to some of the most powerful empires of our time just being built on the idea that there is money to be made from getting people to look at things. Let me now turn to a second period, which I think uh, is also of uh, great importance. And that is the invention of advertising. Now, sometimes you might think that advertising has always been around. And you know, it is true that there's always been signs. And there's always, there have always been people m making available knowledge of what their product is. But I don't, uh, I want to talk about the invention of advertising as an industry advertising as a systematic 
means of converting this thing we talked about, human attention, into something else that's very valuable known as demand or uh, uh, influence because it can be used for either. So that industry is of a, sh a more recent origin. Um, there was a long time where advertising such as it was, and I mean here the late 19th century, was seen as sort of a disgraceful thing something that most industries wouldn't be any part of. The only industry, frankly the one that invented many of the most important techniques that did do advertising was the uh, pharmaceutical industry. And um, they had a series of products, most of which didn't work. So actually snake oil I think might, did work. But there were a lot of other products that were more dubious. And because the product didn't work, they needed advertising. <laughs> so sort of see some of the origins of, of uh, what I'm talking about here. Um, and, uh, but uh, you know, it was sort of a, a side business. It wasn't most, uh, it wasn't most uh, places. And uh, most of the advertisements still look like classified ads. So who do I give credit to for really making advertising, for really proving that advertising works. What entity could it have been? Well, I will tell you. In my estimation, the chief culprit or the chief agent for proving the worth of advertising was none other than the British government in World War I. And let me try to explain why I think that's right. So we need now to turn to the year uh, 1914, uh, August 3rd to be precise, uh, Britain had just declared war on the German Empire uh, be, uh, due to the uh, invasion of Belgium. Um, there was a problem for the British. And do we have, there was a problem for the British that that ad is going to solve, um, which is the British expeditionary force was about 60,000 soldiers, maybe with all the reserves or about 100,000. Um, the German army, I think, if I remember correctly, had about 3 million soldiers and had already defeated many other countries. Um, it was a total mismatch. And in fact, this fellow uh, uh, who, I, who was pictured here, uh, Lord Kitchener, he um, said that my countrymen are very brave. They have uh, declared war, but they have no army. <laughs> so an enormous, uh, the, the, uh, so, so the British government uh, realized in order to field an army, they would have to recruit soldiers. And they began, which is, that which is now understood as the first institutionally organized uh, domestically applied propaganda or advertising campaign directed at their own citizens. Um, and in its effect, in fact, it was totalizing. It makes, uh, so you have to imagine there's not much advertising at this point. So they were able to grab the entire population's attention through posters like the ones you've seen pictured, through bulletin boards, through, through rallies, through, through this, through that, a, a system of uh, uh, th there was a, someone inside the British government said, for propaganda to work, it must be total. And it did work. Um, it's sort of extraordinary how many people signed up. Within a year or so, um, the British government had signed up 350,000 soldiers, which is larger than the current U.S. Army. Um, and uh, off they went. And in fact, um, you know, they went overseas, people started dying and becoming injured. They had to redouble the efforts uh, as people started getting some uh, sense that this might be not the greatest thing to do, uh, go into the trenches and fight the Germans. But um, I uh, want to highlight that period because I think one thing we need to understand for where we are today is that it has really been a cooperation or a exchange of ideas between government and business. Because one of the effects, and here's the more uh, very splendid uh, 
American propaganda. We, the Americans uh, copied the, the British, um, came up with some very successful uh, advertising. And one of the most important impacts of the government propaganda campaigns was to convince business that advertising worked and also to convince them that it was a sort of respectable, reasonable thing to do. And uh, Edward Bernays, who some of you may know is for sort of a famous, uh, some people call it sort of famous for um, inventing the field of public relations and also being the cousin of Sigmund Freud or nephew of Sigmund Freud, which people, many people enjoy that, uh, <laughs> the juxtaposition of those two facts. And you know, he said, we have proved it through government that you can reshape the minds of men. Let us now do that in business. So I want to point out that that was a big role in the invention of advertising. Let me uh, now highlight a third moment that I think is important. Um, have you noticed um, in your lives that um, companies of the world seem to want to know a lot about you? collect a lot of your data. Your so um, there's a number of reasons for doing that. Um, but in my thinking, it all comes back to this idea that if you, the more you know about somebody, the easier it is to manipulate them. Um, maybe it's a strong word. Cater to their interests. <laughs> and what's interesting is the idea of advertising or influence that was catered to any individual is actually relatively new. Well, let's say 100 years old. Um, and its origins lie in the realization, the great realization in the 1920s, that women might be different than men. <laughs> that is the beginnings of what is now called niche marketing or micro-targeting, which just said, let's divide the whole world into two and realize that there are women and there are men and perhaps they will respond differently. Um, as in all things, the uh, early manifestations of this uh, discovery were relatively crude. Um, although they did, uh, at, at J. Uh, J. Walter Thompson, they, they created a special department in, in recognition of this sort of great discovery that um, there was also a discovery at the same time, they're sort of repeat, like, like scientific discoveries, that women supposedly made 80% of the purchasing decisions in the home, at least in 1920. So this was like, uh, this, is the, this is the discovery. Um, so they had a women's department. Some of the people who worked there were former suffragettes, but I can't say the approaches they took are a model of, uh, a, a, a model of uh, respect. Um, so uh, they, they the idea was we need to target things towards, towards women and you know, their interests and try to understand what makes people buy things. So here's an advertisement for, for, uh, for Listerine. Um, <laughs> and uh, the text might be a little hard to read, but it says, uh, Edna, uh, poor Edna. Uh, 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 I actually have trouble reading myself, but it roughly says um, she is quickly reaching the tragic age of 30. Um, and she's as pretty and as interesting as any girl, but no one will tell her the dark secret she has bad breath, heliotosis. <laughs> and um, yeah, often a bridesmaid, never a bride. And so the idea uh, was that uh, Listerine um, can save you from those problems. Uh, uh, the, well, another landmark in advertising in the 1920s was the uh, conversion of um, the, the idea that, uh, and this is Lucky Strike, who is uh, particularly responsible for this, that maybe uh, we can convert the other half of the population, which isn't smoking, into smokers. So in the late 20s, uh, or in, for a long time, uh, smoking by women had been uh, considered taboo. A, uh, 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 the mark, uh, this, I'm going to quote some 20s language, but the, the mark of a, a loose woman or something like that. So the, um, not my personal opinion, <laughs> just to make that clear. And uh, so uh, the president of uh, Lucky Strike uh, hired Edward Bernays 
and some other uh, people and said, well, how do we, uh, how do we um, uh, convince women to start smoking? And uh, they had two ideas. Number one is they said, well, there's this thing called uh, the you know, suffragette movement. Women are demanding equal rights. So what we really need to do is harness the power of that movement. And so they staged a, an Easter parade in, I think, 1929, if I'm not mistaken. They, they staged an event where women ostentatiously were smoking cigarettes in the parade. And they were interviewed. And they said, oh, uh, these are torches of freedom. And we're demonstrating that we have the right, just like men, to smoke in public. So that was one idea orchestrated by a lucky strike. The other idea they had, so one was women to be free. The other theory was, oh, the other theory was women are afraid of being fat. So we'll orchestrate a program. We will suggest that cigarettes make you thin. And um, you can see the ad. Is this you five years from now? Reach for a lucky, or any attempted to overindulge, reach for a lucky instead. So we'll tell women to, uh, so these are the cruder origins of uh, directed uh, marketing. Um, directed marketing also, um, maybe a slightly less uh, dark story. Uh, well, this is now zooming ahead to the 60s. Uh, the other idea in the 60s uh, by brands like Pepsi, which were um, uh, 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 had, had trouble competing with Coca-Cola, um, started, they had a, a Negro marketing department or something, and they started uh, uh, marketing to black people. So it's not all uh, 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 doom and gloom. So the, the, fourth, um, the fourth invention I want to tell you about um, that I think is relevant to our times is the invention of addictive uh, technologies. So um, if you had, uh, get his name right, imagine it is the year 1973 or so, uh, uh, and you have, we're meeting a fellow named Stephen uh, Luc uh, Lukasik. He was a, a physicist who was the uh, head of the ARPA, it's the Advanced Research Project Network, Advanced Research Projects Division in the Pentagon. Um, if you met this gentleman, uh, he would have been carrying a massive computer terminal with him on his back uh, with a teletype and things like that. And uh, he carried that everywhere he went. And when he arrived somewhere, he would plug in the telephone cord into a, into a telephone jack, dial in, because he was the world's first email addict. I went <laughs> carefully to figure this out. He had decided that email was the way of the future. He was ahead of his time. Um, of course, technology was more bulky then, so he wore this thing like a turtle on his back. <laughs> so actually, we may laugh at him, but he is sort of a, a predecessor to us. Couldn't go anywhere uh, without it. And uh, I, I think one of the most important and effective uh, inf intentional hacks of the last 40 years has been the invention and popularization of addictive uh, technologies. So um, the next landmark, uh, the first uh, e email uh, addict, uh, was a company named uh, Quantum Leap, which was later renamed America Online. Uh, they, um, uh, they were uh, not particularly successful at first. But they uh, decided that they want to, they bet uh, everything on the idea that, well, they didn't have any content or anything like that. They couldn't afford it. So let's, let's let the people talk to each other as much as they want. In fact, they bet hard on email and open forums and chat rooms. And they just let 100 flowers bloom. Um, and uh, they started with this, you've got mail. So that sort of spread things further, I think. Um, and of course, in our times, uh, we have the, the, the descendants of those approaches, which are social media and most obviously Facebook and uh, Instagram. Now, this is sort of an interdisciplinary talk. Um, and I want to bring in a little bit of behavioral psychology into this. Um, and if I screw it up, uh, someone can tell me. 
But uh, one of the um, things that I, uh, one of the figures I'm interested in is, is B.F. Skinner, um, is a behavioral psychologist from the 20th century. And uh, this is a guy who's put pigeons in boxes and encouraged them to, to peck on things. And uh, he made a number of discoveries, which I think, you know, he's kind of a creepy guy in some ways. He um, did this, you know, he had these little pigeons in boxes, whatever, and everyone knows about those, but he also, I thought this was an urban myth, but it wasn't. Because he also raised his daughter in a little box <laughs> that had a little glass wall. And, you know, they kind of minimized it in some of the later reporting, but it was actually a box. He tried to, he actually tried to sell it to other people. Um, <laughs> it wasn't successful for some reason. Anyway, uh, he, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Skinner, he made a number of observations. And um, one, one, I think, which uh, helps explain it, uh, some of our addictive uh, technology uh, properties was that um, uh, a variable reward schedule can actually be more successful in keeping people hooked than, than a constant reward schedule. What do I mean by that? Well, he found with pigeons that if they um, you know, pecked on something and a little biscuit came out or something, um, after a while they get tired of it, especially they got full. But they pecked on things and then unpredictably something came out. Well, that really got them hooked. Um, I was sort of thinking this today when I was surfing this morning and I was watching the waves coming. And, you know, some of them are good and some of them are bad and everyone knows how addictive that is. They're fishing. But uh, you can see very quickly that, that e uh, email and many of our online lives are structured very similarly. You know, you go and you think, oh, you know, I've got to check my inbox and see what's there. And you know, most of the time it's pretty disappointing. <laughs> Maybe you have better lives than me, I don't know. But uh, you know, mostly, oh, you know, uh, we have a meeting or you know, do this thing. But occasionally you get something great like, hey, how'd you like come give a talk in Hawaii? <laughs> right, and so like that kind of thing, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing keeps you coming back. And um, I think we have, uh, you know, partially in my book, my work, I've been interested in, in, in what are the rituals and uh, and the habits that, that uh, can control our attentional lives. And I would be surprised, and you can think to yourself, if you don't, even at this moment, sort of in the back of your head, think you need to check in with something. You know, do I need to check my email? Do I want to see Facebook? Do I want to see what was posted on Instagram? I mean, I don't know who you are. Do I want to see if anyone responded to my tweet? I don't know, does anyone still have a blog? Do I, do, you know, do I want to see if I have any comments on my blog? Do I want to see what ridiculous thing the president said yesterday? Like whatever it is, some, something that you sort of feel like you got to check on to see if it's, and I think that check-in, it's actually even replaced prime time. It's like the prime organizing power. If you're not in the check-in, you know, if I give this talk in Silicon Valley, I'll say like, if you're not, people aren't, since they have to come back on. Everyone knows that now. Um, and I think that is one of the, the organizing thing. And I, in some ways, it, so, I mean, the, I said this was a dark talk, but I, in some ways, we're a little bit like the pigeons in the box, <laughs> poking away. Uh, the difference is, of course, that we're uh, also being surveilled at all times. So we, they, you know everything about the pigeon, and you know all its habits, and you know wow. when to have it a little. So anyway, that, that's, our, that's our current life. Um, so I don't want to go on uh, forever. Let, let me sort of try and finish with what I, I think uh, the challenges we face and uh, what I think we, we should do. Um, so, as I said, I believe um, there has uh, been a great effort to commodify human attention. Uh, I believe, uh, in fact, that we've had a harvesting, a great harvesting of our own, of our consciousness. Um, and I am a believer in what I sometimes call the human reclamation project. I sort of believe like, even, you know, sometimes there'll be a, a parking lot, it's all paved over, and then they break it up, and then the grass starts growing again. I think that can be us. I think many of us are, I mean, maybe you live in Hawaii, you're not as bad as New Yorkers, but many of us are just a little too addled, lost, distracted, you know. And, but I think it can be done. Um, and there's, uh, there's several ways I think it, it can be done. Um, so part of it is, um, uh, part of it is uh, personal. I think that um, 
you know, get, get, get coming into an encounter with how you spend your time and attention is, is important. Um, it's particularly important, I think, for, for younger people. I, I sometimes think that younger people have worse attentional habits than, than older uh, people. Um, uh, I, I don't know how it is in, in, in Honolulu, Hawaii. In New York, we have a real public safety problem where people can't no longer walk down the street without their phones in their hands. And it's, it's, it's becoming dangerous um, in a lot of ways. So kind of, um, and, but the thing is for this, these are powerful tools we're living with. They're, they're difficult to, to, they're addictive, they're interesting, they, they reward you. There's always something going on. So you have to have these kind of bright line rules if you want to try and have any hope of dealing with this. Like, you know, maybe don't sleep with your phone. I don't know if you do. No, 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 no judgment, but maybe you could think about like maybe no phone, you know, no phone in the bedroom, or, or um, you know, I try not to use my computer after 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 dinner. Doesn't always succeed, but whatever. You sort of have to set these sort of zoning categories in your life. Um, I also think there's a room for government to help out. It's it's not easy. It's it's hard to explain how it should happen. But I am a big advocate because it's hard to monitor day by day. You can't order people like conserve their attention or be more mindful or anything. But I, I do think that, um, that surveillance has gotten out of control. It is strange that we've set up this, these, this world where, where so much is being collected about us all the time j just to understand how to better influence us. And I just think that that is something that needs to be done, something about that we haven't been able to get our arms around. Anyway, um, I can say more in questions. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. I'll leave you again. I want to return to that, to that uh, where I began. I hope to convince you that attention is important, that the content, I want you, I think, become, visible, become kind of aware of the contest for attention as it affects our lives. Um, and I just want to leave us back with that idea I began with, that uh, this is really it, uh, you know, when you are uh, thinking about your life and what it is and what you want to do, a lot of it comes down to how you spend your consciousness, where you put your attention. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you might have. All right, so we have about 30 minutes for questions, and uh, Debbie Halpert and I will, will come around and, and gather them, and then maybe at the end, if we start to run out of time, we'll get uh, two or three, and uh, Tim can answer them um, all at once. Um, all right, up here. Thank you for the talk, I appreciate it. I'm wondering uh, how you feel um, public subsidies might fit into media to help take away the advertising? Oh, that's, that's a good question. So I, uh, I want something to happen that hasn't happened yet. But I'm, um, and let me explain what it is. So among other things, I'm also interested in the history of the media. So they, they, the, the invention of the 60s, one of the most lastingly important inventions of the 60s was, uh, was the idea of public media, um, and which we now know as PBS and NPR in the United States. And I believe there should be a movement for a public social network or a public social media, um, which starts from a different premise. So Facebook will say to you that our main goal is to connect you with your family and friends. Um, but in fact, they have two goals. Or three, one is to connect you, but they also have to make those connections valuable to advertisers, because that's their business model, and they have, to, they have to spy on you as much as possible. So they have all these other interests, too. They, they have two masters. What if you had a, a social media that started from the premise that it really was trying to improve your relationship with people, or really was trying to help you, you know, find people, and that was it, and they didn't have some other thing in the back of their head they also wanted to do? So I'm a big believer in that. I don't know how I make it happen. I've been sort of trying to figure out uh, how, to, how to do it. Sometimes I've been thinking maybe PBS could do it, maybe it could be funded. But that, that, that's a big thing in our lives, I think, is trying to develop some that we have allowed too many things just become fully commercialized, and, and a public role would be very welcome. So thanks for that question. Could you talk a little bit more about surveillance? Because when I think surveillance, I think like drones in the sky, and cameras, uh -huh. and I. I think you're probably thinking of something different than that. Yeah, I think of all data collection as surveillance. 
Um, so that maybe that's what I what I think. So, um, you know, we have most of us carry around these kind of miniature surveillance devices, which we also call phones, and they kind of keep track of where you go, you know, keep track of what you say, and uh, report back to the mothership what you're reading, where you're buying from. So, you know, I think it's gone a little bit overboard. Um, you know, there's one thing when, uh, you know, if you're going to buy a airplane ticket, you have to tell people some information about who you are and stuff. But so much of the collection of information is just completely gratuitous. You know, you download like an app to learn how to make cocktails or something, and then it tracks everywhere you go and sells it to somebody else. And, so, and I, I, I think that the knowing too much about us um, is not good for our character, because I think ultimately it leads to a society where everything panders to you, or at least what they think you are, and drives you in, in, in directions based on a guess as to who you are. And I think that's bad for character. I also think it polarizes the country. Right? I mean, Democrat or Republican or whatever, you do a couple searches for you know, stuff on the alt-right, suddenly your whole life becomes alt-right or something, you know, based on this guess of who you are. And, and if you think you're immune to this stuff, you're kidding yourself. So that's what, I'm, that's what I don't like about surveillance. I think there is something fundamental to human liberty to having less known about you. It's easier for me to see how very large governmental bodies, the US government, the EU, mm -hmm. could regulate or alter the landscape in which these giant technology conglomerates operate. Right. But um, what might smaller scale jurisdictions like the city of Honolulu or the state of Hawaii or the Hawaii judiciary, what are smaller interventions that might be made mm -hmm. in this field that could still be meaningful? That's a good question. Uh, thank you. So the advantage of the federal government is that it's powerful. The disadvantage of the federal government is it's craven and captured. So there's that, that's the problem. I mean, there's good parts of the federal government. I work there. But um, on some of these issues, it's uh, asleep at the wheel, unfortunately. And I think cities and states actually have been leaders in some of these areas. So you know, some cities are starting to ban facial recognition technologies. It's just you know, crossing too many lines about knowing too many people. So that's something you know, the city of Honolulu could do, for example. The states are currently, collectively, are quite strong. The states have a lawsuit that might break up Facebook into three pieces, just to sort of reduce its power. Um, I will admit to some role in that lawsuit. And uh, so you know, states can join in those sorts of efforts. I'm wondering if there is something happening with regard to brain chemistry, for example. Are we going to reach a point of no return because our consciousness or our minds will lose that capacity for individuation? That is a great question. Um, one version of it is, are we devolving? And can you, it's sort of the opposite of the singularity, which is this idea we're going to become, or some computers can become smarter than, we're going to become permanently worse and unable to remember, you know, we pick up, the, what were these things, these books we used to read? I can't read them, forget it. Um, so I do think we're doing that. I think we're becoming technologically reliant. I think we're evolving in different ways. I also think in fundamental ways we have taken charge of human evolution right now. And this is another book, which I might write or might not. But and I don't think we really fully understand where we're going with the direction that we're taking the species. In fact, it's kind of random. And um, the destiny of the species is something we should aspire to be a little more careful about. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. We'll see you there.